Welcome to the first online lab for Bio 142 and we'll be starting out with the heart. So one of the things I really want you to make to pay attention to is anything that says a structure list or has the term structures in it. Occasionally there will be things that I won't necessarily write out every structure but the structures will be in more of a written format. But anyway if I do have a structure list those are the terms I will expect you to know for the tests. So looking at this, we have structures of the heart. The first thing we have is the pericardium, which is divided into the fibrous pericardium, the serous pericardium, and the serous per pericardium is further divided into the parietal and the visceral pericardium. And the visceral pericardium is also known as the epicardium. So let's look and see what that would look like. Before we actually talk about the pericardium though, Let's talk about something that will help you understand why the uh, certain parts of the heart are named what they are and also help us understand about blood flow and the arteries and veins which blood is flowing in. So this is a really important concept. Our blood actually flows in two different circuits. The pulmonary circuit, which basically means to and from the lungs, from the heart, to and from the lungs. So here here we're going to the lungs, here we're coming from the lungs, okay? And then the systemic circuit, which means to and from the rest of the systems, in other words, the rest of the body. Now in our picture, we see here, we have in the pulmonary circuit, we have pulmonary arteries and pulmonary veins. Now most of us, when we talk about arteries and veins, we think of the systemic circuit, the systemic artery and systemic veins, because Whereas this is basically just dealing with one of the systems, this is dealing with the other 10 systems. Okay, now, um, so obviously this circuit is much bigger than that, but we still need to understand what do we mean by arteries and what do we mean by veins? Because looking at this graphic here, we see that the red means the arteries are highly oxygenated and blue means that the veins are or in either picture, blue means poorly oxygenated blood. So highly oxygenated blood is in the systemic arteries. Poorly oxygenated blood is in the systemic veins. But the opposite is true in the pulmonary circuit. In the pulmonary circuit, the, the arteries are actually poorly oxygenated and the veins are highly oxygenated. So if that's the case, what's our actual definition of an artery and a vein? And the actual definition is arteries always take blood away from the heart. So if I'm taking blood away from the heart towards the lungs, I'm a pulmonary artery. Veins always take blood to the heart. So if I'm taking blood from the lungs back to the heart, well, when I took blood away from the heart, it was because it was oxygen poor and the lungs fed it oxygen. So now the blood vessels going back to the heart are visiting the heart. So veins visit, arteries go away. So if it's pulmonary veins they are visiting the heart with oxygenated blood now for the rest of the body the opposite is true as far as you know uh, uh, the oxygenated versus the oxygen poor arteries still take blood away from the body notice that the aorta the biggest artery in the body is taking blood away from the heart to the rest of the body but it's taking oxygenated blood away from the heart so so and, and systemic veins are taking blood to the heart. So the oxygen poor blood going to the heart are veins. So again, if you'll always remember veins visit the heart, arteries take it away from the heart, you will never be wrong. But then when you remember that when we're going away from the heart to the lungs, it's because we're carrying oxygen poor blood there. And when we're going to the heart from the lungs, we're carrying oxygen rich blood. So again, artery away, veins visit. Now back to what we had started with, which was the pericardium, the actual, the actual uh, sac that surrounds the heart. Now the pericardium again has an outer portion called the fibrous pericardium and an inner portion called a serous pericardium that has two sides to it, okay? The serous pericardium has an outside portion, which is on the inside of the fibrous area, it's actually called the parietal pericardium. And then it has a portion that adheres to the heart muscle itself called the visceral pericardium. I know that's a little counterintuitive, but let's look at this next picture. And notice again, okay, I've got this very outside, just this dark line on the outside representing the fibrous pericardium. 
Then my serous pericardium has this inside line, which is the parietal pericardium, this inside line here, and then the, the part of the sac that actually adheres to the heart itself, if we imagine the fist as the heart, that's the visceral. Now you'll see the terms parietal and visceral a lot. Viscera sometimes meaning organ, but sometimes you will even be inside of an organ and the outer portion is the parietal area. The inner portion is the visceral area. So those terms will come up again in different things we will talk about. Now, another thing about the heart that we want to go ahead and describe is the apex or the pointed area of the heart versus the base, the bigger, broader area at the top of the heart. So the apex is, you know, an apex is more of a a pointed, pointed area and a base is more of a flatter area. And that's especially apparent on the back side of the heart. Okay, so we've discussed pericardium and the different parts of it. We actually went ahead and talked about base and apex, but let's talk about the myocardium and endocardium really quickly. The myocardium is the muscle of the heart. It is the majority of the heart. It's what the cardiac muscle cells make up. Myo means muscle. Cardia means heart, obviously, so it's the muscle of the heart. So let's look at that real quick. So again, I see my outside dense fibrous layer, the fibrous pericardium. I see the inside portion of the outside, which is part of the serous pericardium, because you can actually see these, these cells here. And of course, that's going to be the parietal pericardium. Then I see my myocardium here. All these muscle cells, there's intercalated discs where muscle cells are coming together and lining the myocardium on the outside. So if I took out that, the, you know, the dense portion of the pericardium, what, what I would have adhering to the myocardium on this outside would be that visceral pericardium. All right. So again, I've got my outside, which has the dense fibrous layer. I've got the inside of that, which is part of my serous pericardium, and it's the parietal pericardium. Then I've got this little thin layer adhering to the myocardium called the visceral pericardium, which is also part of the serous pericardium. Now here I've got my here I've got my myocardium heart muscle and then lining the chambers inside of the heart. So lining here we see the external portion, but lining the inside chambers where blood is actually going to be, you know, running into this area so we can squeeze it into other areas. This inside area is actually called endocardium, and it's smooth. It's simple squamous epithelial layers against a real or tissue, and, and uh, just sim very similar to the setup of the epicardium, the very smooth layer on the outside. Well, I've got a smooth layer on the inside, and the purpose for that is fluid, in this case blood, is squeezed and runs much easier with a lot less friction if it's a smooth surface than if it were to hit just the myocardial surface. Okay, back to our list. Now we see the term oracles, and I want to go ahead and mention to you that the term oracle is often interchangeable with the term atrium or atria, but the technical difference is oracle is usually the literal fleshy outer covering of the chamber, where the atrium is the chamber itself. But you will often see them used interchangeably, but specifically the or oracle is more of the actual structure where the atria is more of the chamber, the space, and the structure included. Okay, now we have superior vena cava, inferior vena cava, right atrium with our pectinate muscle, which you can either use the term pectinate muscle or muscula pectinati, and this term called fossa ovale. So let's look at those. Okay, so here we see our superior vena cava. Here we see our inferior vena cava. Notice they are sending blood to visit the heart. Therefore, they are veins. And that happens to be part of the systemic circuit, not the pulmonary circuit, because it doesn't have anything to do with the lungs at this point. It is bringing blood back from the systems of the body. So since it's visiting, it's a vein, and it's also oxygen-poor blood. Okay, now notice then I have my right atrium. It is surrounded by this fleshy area, which is called an oracle. On the back of the oracle, or when I say the back of it, within the oracle are muscles called pectinate muscles, also called musculi pectinati. I'll accept either term for that, but that is the, that is the muscles of the oracles, and uh, they are much, much, much thinner than the muscles of the ventricles. Okay, and, and they are going to have a job of squeezing the blood from the from the atria 
both right and left atria down into the ventricles. But uh, most of the blood that actually goes from the atria to the ventricles is not squeezed, but rather it moves passively from the atria to the ventricles. But about the, the last 30% is, is actually squeezed into the ventricles. We'll be talking about that in the lecture. Okay, now if you'll notice there's a little indent, a little uh, indented area here, because we know an ov we know that uh, a fossa is a depression, and this is an oval-shaped depression that actually used to be a hole, and we'll be uh, discussing that further when we talk about fetal circulation. But when we take our first breath, this hole that served as a valve, so blood could go through it from the right atrium to the left atrium, and we'll find out why later, that hole closes up when our pressure differences change once we start breathing our lungs and, and the pressure of our blood changes at that time. And again, that will make more sense later on. Okay, so we, we have, again, the right atrium, the left atrium, the flap of tissue covering it is the auricle. It has pectinate muscle inside of it. Uh, and then we actually have the, the opening between the, the right atrium and the right ventricle. And we have a valve, and this is called an atrioventricular tricuspid valve. And in tricuspid, because it has three areas we call cusps, those cusps are tied to or anchored to cone-shaped muscles called papillary muscles, and they are they are braced by these tendinous cords called chordae tendinae or tendinae. There are different ways you can pronounce that. Okay, and we have the we have those atrioventricular uh, valves in both of the areas between the atrium and the ventricle, atrium and the ventricle. But only the one on the right side is a three-cusp or tricuspid. The one on the left side is a bicuspid or two-cusp valve. All right, now um, we'll discuss why it's important. Because what valves do overall is they allow one-way flow of blood. So once blood goes from the atria to the ventricles, we don't want it to back up, back into the atria once the blood in the ventricles start squeezing. We want the blood, and, and this is a real important point right here, it is always the pressure of the blood being squeezed that opens or closes valves. Valves don't have an electrical system per se in them to open or close them. Now they do have an electrical system that we're going to talk about, the intrinsic conducting system, which helps brace these cone-shaped muscles here that are called papillary muscles. So this cone-shaped muscles called papillary muscles that literally do contract and we send a signal to them to cause a, you know, an, an action potential to cause the cardiac muscle to contract. When they contract then, it causes them to be able to brace the valves through tightening up these chordae tendinae. And then that way when blood hits it, the valve shut, but the valves don't flap back into the other chamber. If they did that, the blood would go back through that. Now, there are certain heart conditions, one being something called mitral valve prolapse, where if you got if you get a loosened chordae tendinae, where you can't brace it once you once you uh, contract the, these muscles here, then if the blood hits it, where it would kind of shut off the blood flow back, if that's stretched, or, injured, or destroyed in some way, then the flap can actually can actually be overcome by the pressure and push the blood back where it came from. So under normal conditions, though, once we start squeezing the ventricles so the blood goes out through these vessels, the pulmonary trunk and the aorta, then uh, the, the pressure of the blood going in this direction also closes those valves to prevent them from backflowing. So I went ahead and uh, discussed the uh, uh, right atrium, the pectinate muscle, the fossa valley, the atrioventricular tricuspid valve. Again, it's between the atria and the ventricles, so that's why we get the first part of the name. It has three cusps, so it's the tricuspid valve. I also mentioned the bicuspid valve, which only has two cusps, and it's also called the mitral valve. And then we talked about the, uh, the papillary muscles and the chordae tendinae. So the papillary muscles were the cone-shaped muscles that actually brace the chordae tendinae that are coming from the tricuspid valves once blood's pushed through them. Then the next thing will be the, the muscle patterns of the ventricles are called trabecula carnae.